Good evening and welcome to the, uh, the scheduled meeting of the Grand Board Central Village School District Board of Education. Would you please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming out here on any somewhat rainy <laughs> venturing out of the weather. We appreciate it. Would you please take a roll? Mr. Jennings. Here. Mr. Miller. Here. Dr. Cornwell. Here. Mr. Davis. Here. Mr. Wolf. Here. That is the best part of our meeting. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not referring to Mr. Brown speaking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it is usually the best part of the evening where we get to commend uh, several different groups, of, whether it's kids or, or uh, staff members. But tonight, we are recognizing two GES kindergarten teachers. So uh, Mariah Gibbs and Janine Durham, come on up and stand here awkwardly as I talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this evening, after I stop talking, Mr. Burnett is going to talk a lot about the achievements of the school district. And what we know is that those achievements are not possible without high quality teachers, period. And we know that in a lot of cir circumstances, the high school gets a lot of credit for the achievements of our, our students because that's the end of their journey. But I'm gonna tell you tonight that it all starts here, okay? With two individuals that teach kindergarten. So, Janine was nominated and received the Transcendia Excellence in Education Award, and Mariah Gibbs received the Jody Van Tyne Award uh, for, from the Education Foundation. So, when I say kindergarten is foundational, I mean um, everything builds off of that experience. And what we have here in our foundational aspect of our school district is a level of excellence that's second to none. Um, I've been in their classrooms. I know what they do. It honestly scares me more than calculus does. Um, because kindergartners, they, they throw at you just about anything possible that can, they can throw at you. And they have an energy level that is unparalleled. So on a day-to-day -day basis, the work that they do has to physically exhaust them. So, um, I know that it takes a strong network from a family standpoint to support the work that you guys do as well. But um, on behalf of the Board of Education, the Granville students, parents, and community, we want to thank you and recognize you for your excellence in education and providing what I think is the exemplary foundation for our students. So congratulations. And we appreciate your service, so you get little gifts. <laughs> so, congratulations. Going to come and give a little report about the beginning of school at GHS. 
Hello, um, I'm Kristen Zale. I'm a senior at Granville High School. I'm a student body president. And I just want to give you a little picture of what, um, how the school year is starting. And I just thank you, first of all, for the, the privilege to be able to come here and to come visit you uh, throughout the year and just give a report and give a uh, student opinion. So a little bit about me. I play field hockey and lacrosse. I sing in the choir. I'm a Latin club president. I'm pretty much involved in everything else. <laughs> so you can be sure that I'm getting an accurate picture of everything that's going on. So first of all, the sports um, this fall are kicking off great. Um, volleyball, football, soccer all have great seasons. And even if a sport is enjoying a great season, such as field hockey, we're still having fun. So that's good. And um, so theater-wise, the auditions for the theater program were last week, and the plays that um, they're preparing for are in the fall called 110 Stories, which is about 9-11, and in the winter it's called Beverly Hillbillies, which is about, it's like a comedy, so that'll be really funny. Um, the music programs are all preparing for their fall concerts coming up, so band, orchestra, and choir are all putting in a lot of work for that. And the marching band, of course, is doing great, um, not only performing every Friday night, but also at various band competitions, ranging from Ohio University to Jackson, Ohio. And then also, homecoming is the buzz of the school at the moment. <laughs> um, that kicks off um, October 1st with the parade and bonfire. And then we have the football game versus Northbridge, and of course, the dance. So that's all the extracurriculars going on at Grandma High School, and I thank you so much for opportunity to talk to you and I hope you have a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Yes, you. you don't have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. That brings us right into staff reports. Right. So Mr. Burnett is going to uh, get set up to talk about the local report card and the quality profile. But here was exciting as oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, as everybody knows, our local report card came out uh, last week along with our quality profile. So I'm going to give a, a brief overview of both um, and just the things that were um, encompassed in both of those. So the report card this year, the nice thing for once, there's not a whole lot of changes. Um, the air tests are in year three uh, for the state test, math and ELA in grades three through 10. That ends with algebra one and geometry at the high school level. Science is grades five, eight, and biology. And then there is one slight change that we talked about last year. Social studies is just US history and government now. The grades four and six social studies tests are no longer uh, present. Um, so you get the early fall time frame for the second year in a row. I remember that very first year we got like a spring release and then a fall release right after that. So it was like kind of back to back. We're back on a normal schedule from ODE's perspective. And the six components that make up the report card have not changed. Achievement, K3 literacy, progress, prepare for success, graduation, graduation rate, and gap closing. Uh, the one new thing this year is there is an overall grade. So they take the scores and all six of those components that uh, school districts have and you get an overall grade. Uh, our overall grade um, this, year, this year, as you know, was an A. Uh, there were 28 A's out of 607 districts statewide. And it was pretty much a bell curve in terms of what that distribution looked like um, statewide on the state test. So this is our uh, overview and then what we scored in each area. You'll notice that we have four A's, one area that's not rated, and a B in prepared for success. So what I want to do is just very quickly go through each of those, explain how we got those grades, um, answer any questions, maybe pull out some pieces of data that you don't really see in the report card unless you dig a little bit deeper. So the first one is the achievement component. And the achievement component is actually made of two different parts. It's the indicators met from all the test areas plus your performance index. Your performance index, very simply, is how, do you, how well do your students do on each of the tests? Not just that they pass or not. That's what these indicator percentages over here um, measure. So the first part of this, there are 22 different tests and then there are two non-test areas. One is the gifted indicator, which we've had right from the beginning. Uh, and this is a new indicator called chronic absenteeism. If your students miss more than 10% of the school year, um, you actually get a rating for that from the state uh, because it's a significant part of achievement. And, that was sarcastic, sorry. Um, and 
if you're below 12%, you meet that indicator. That indicator percentage is going to go down a little bit each year until it gets down to 5%. Um, so right now our chronic absentee um, measure was 7.9% of our population missed more than 10%. So if a student is ill and out of school, they, that counts against you. Um, they go on a couple vacations with their family, that counts against you. They just decide to miss school for whatever reason, that counts against you. It all counts against you whether it's excused or unexcused. Uh, but 10% is the threshold for that. We're well below the 12%. Um, we'll have some work to do as that number gets smaller and smaller. Um, so we met 23 of the 24 indicators. The indicators you have to reach 80% to pass. We did not meet 7th grade math again. We've talked about this, this every year, I think, that 7th grade math, we have a large percentage of our students that skip 7th grade math. So that end size is very small. They missed it by two students. Um, so they're very upset by that. But their scores are still in the top 15% um, top in the state um, in that particular subject area. So um, they're doing really well. It's just, you know, we take students from 6th grade to 8th grade math, um, but it's top 60% in that grade level. So um, it's still a very high score, one that we're not concerned with. We're not going to worry about needing an indicator and, and not doing what's best for kids at that point. Then over here is how the students actually do on the tests, not just if they pass or not. So we had 42% um, of our kids and change scored at the advanced or advanced plus level. The advanced plus level, those kids scored advanced, but they were accelerated in a particular subject. So if a fifth grade student takes a sixth grade test and scores advanced, then you become advanced plus in that, but they really just scored advanced in that. 27% scored accelerated, and then you see the percentages for proficient and below proficient as well. Um, so basically, when you're looking at this, about 70% of our kids scored advanced or accelerated uh, on the state test. This then is used to calculate performance index. A perfect performance index according to the state is 120. So they take this 107 divided by 120 and you get a percentage. This 107 constitutes the highest performance index we've had since air tests have started. Uh, we've gone up incrementally each year. Um, last year we were 106.1, this year we were 107.0. Um, in general, that was a trend we saw across the state. In, uh, the state scores for some districts went down, some districts went up, but in general they went up just a little bit last year. And that number is not comparable to past years when there's been a similar kind of number because it's been different testing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we had, I remember the old OGTs and OAAs, it was in the 111s, 110s. Right. Um, and, and so the real measure that you can look at is where do you rank in the state compared to other school districts? And back then we were getting, you know, 111s, 110s, and so on and so forth. But we were 32, 35, 33, 31, 25 in the state. This PI score is ranked 13th in the state. Um, so we've continually gone up, even though the score may fluctuate. Your ranking in the state is kind of gives you at least a benchmark for how you're falling compared to other districts you want to compare yourself to. That's the top score in Central Ohio as well. So they take those two components. They take 75% of this um, performance index score and 25% of this uh, indicator score, 23 out of 24, to get to 94.8%, and they mash those together, put it into a table that I'm not going to show you up here, um, and that's how you get your A for this um, particular measure. So again, last year we were 106.1. Um, just some other things that I pulled out of the data that's available online for anybody to look at. 16 of the 22 subjects we tested were in the top 50 in the state. So you can actually rate how your student's passage percentage were, was in each of the different areas. Last year we were 12 out of 24. Um, so we improved uh, significantly in that area. And then we're one of only 38 districts to meet the gifted indicator. The gifted indicator is a measure of how well your gifted students perform, um, what their growth is. They have to have at least an average level of growth, or it's got an above level um, average growth percentage. And then how well you serve your gifted students, if you're serving them or not. Um, so we ended up meeting all three of those indicators. Only 38 districts out of the 607 districts in the state did not meet that. Some of them meet the indicator, but they don't serve all their gifted students, or some of them serve all their gifted students, but they don't score well enough on the state assessments. Those are usually two things that keep people out of that, uh, of meeting that indicator. What's, how do you know if you've served the gifted student? What's the If they get a WAP or a WAP. If they get a written education plan or a, a written acceleration plan. Um, based on clustering, based on taking AP classes at the high school level, um, honors classes, that we call honors classes advanced, um, that's just a different terminology. You can serve them in any numerous amount of ways, acceleration is another service model, um, and then we have our discovery program at 
GIS. So there's an identification requirement, but this is really about whether there is a identification plan associated with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay. So which we do throughout all the grades. We Absolutely. We do all throughout elementary and everything as well. Deprecated or right. cars are identified when we don't yeah. know them yet. So yeah. that's that's the only place where we don't. Right. Um, and our change in service model at the elementary school won't necessarily negatively impact that either. No. Because we still will be doing web service. Yeah, that's that will what that caused us to do is be a little more, not a little more, a lot more intentional about placing students in classes. So if you have 30 students in the class that are gifted in reading, you try to cluster those students together in groups of six, seven, eight, depending on the number of students you have, so that um, they form a what's called a gifted cluster within that classroom. The entire classroom is not gifted, just that cluster of students, and then the teacher, we, we do a lot of professional development with our staff. Um, you know, and project-based learning is a perfect example of that because that can be applied to all students at all levels um, to serve those gifted students in those particular areas. Okay, the next is the K-3 literacy component. I put this one next because this is the area we didn't get a rating, but we actually got a score. So if you go online and look at this, um, the way K-3 K literacy is measured is if a student was off track in 2016-17 in the fall, are they now on track from a reading perspective in 2017-18 in the fall. Um, so this is a fall to fall measurement, except for the very last part, which I'll get to in grades K through three. So if you look at this, we had three students that were off track in the fall of 2016-2017 on the diagnostic we gave for reading, which is the MAP test, which is a state approved uh, assessment that we can give. None of those students became on track in the fall of 2017-18, that's why it's three to zero. First grade, we had 14 off track, and then we had five on track in the fall of their second grade year. 31 were off track in second grade, and I'll explain why that number is a little bit bigger here in a second. 21 of them were back on track in the fall of their third grade year. The reason this number is so much larger, this is the first time that students, when they take the math test, they have to read it themselves. In kindergarten and first grade, it's read to them. Quite a shift, moving into second grade, and all of a sudden, they have to read it themselves, and they just don't do well the very first time. And you can see that 21 of them getting back on track at that point, that's a, a significant percentage right there. Um, just a, a flaw in the diagnostics, uh, but this is how the state measures it. The third part of this is how many students were off track at the beginning of third grade, but then at least passed the state assessment. So you basically have about eight, you know, six months, seven months until they test to get that student from an off track status to an on track status. Um, so they add all these numbers up to get the denominator, and this is how many students we got back on track, and you divide those two, and that's where this percentage comes from. The average for the state is made the lowest level of a C in this particular report card. So the average for the state last year was 34.9% of students who were off track got back on track. Uh, we felt 45.8, so had we got a grade here, we would have had a C, however, we had less than 5% of our kindergartners identified as off track. And because of that, we get a no grade because now you're getting into very small numbers from an end size perspective and that can identify individual students. Um, so you have to have at least 5% to be off track in kindergarten or you get a no rating. This doesn't affect us, it doesn't help us or hurt us in our grade card. Um, but it's important, I mean, we don't stop looking at it because we don't get a grade. Uh, this is very good data. Last year, this number was 28% for us. Um, so we saw some significant improvement. And if, you also, if you remember from uh, one of the presentations we gave last year, last summer was the first time we did summer intervention um, for a lot of students that normally wouldn't get summer intervention through Title I services. And I think that, along with some great work by our teachers in the classroom, is why you saw that 18% jump. Uh, that's significant from one year to the next. Third grade guarantee is not a graded component, but it is on the report card. And it basically says how many of your students made it from third grade to fourth grade, um, and how did they do that? Either they met the threshold um, on the state assessment, or they met a threshold on the MAP or Terranova test. And 100% of our students either passed the state assessment, 97% um, of them, or five got the alternative pathway through MAP or Terranova. And then we had one student that was exempt because of an IEP, and one who was alternately assessed um, in that particular class. So 100% of our kids move on to fourth grade. That's a good thing. Graduation rate is very self-explanatory, but there's two graduation rates that they look at here. One is your four-year graduation rate, and one is the five-year graduation rate. 
So if you remember, a couple times we've said, you know, why is our graduation rate so low? Why is it like 96%, 95%? We talked about that fifth year that some of our special education students, uh, where they go to Project Search or other programs um, in the county. Well, that's, if you look at our four year to five year, that's the difference in these two. Um, when we had one student that was in our original cohort in 2016 who didn't even finish at Granville High School but didn't get a diploma, so they counted against us. Um, all the rest of those students made it to graduation at that point. Um, from the previous class, and we would expect this number to be 99.5 or 100% again next year as well. So the five year rate is going to be a little bit higher because of um, some of those fifth year programs um, that we have. So the gap closing component changed a little bit. Um, these are based on subgroups. And normally we've only had two or three subgroups uh, for each area. And now the end size for a subgroup is reduced from 30 to 25. When that happened, that moved our number of subgroups from three or four to eight in this district. So now we have subgroups of all students, Asian or Pacific Islander students, Hispanic, multiracial, white, economically disadvantaged, English learner and students with disabilities. And you're rated on what those students are expected to score in each subgroup area um, and if you meet that goal or not. So the areas in yellow are areas that um, we met the goal um, and even in some cases met the long-term goal, which is met for five years from now, or well above in most areas, which is good for the future. It doesn't mean we rest on our worlds, it just means we're in a really good place right now uh, from an English language arts perspective. And you'll see the same thing when we get to math. The one area that we did meet, we only had um, 24 of our students, or excuse me, yeah, 24 of our Asian Pacific Islander students passed the ELA test. We needed to have 25 to meet the goal. So we, that's the one area we didn't make, and that's why we got seven out of 800 points in ELA. We needed one more student to pass the test, because the goal was 92.4, and we only had 91.07%. Um, so it's something we'll look at, um, just like in the past where we've had other subgroups not meet particular areas um, and look at individual students there in that particular, but that's, that's district-wide, grades three through high school. In math, uh, we were 800 out of 800. Again, the same subgroups. You see we have eight different subgroups up here. Um, and again, look at the long-term <coughs> goals for our Hispanic students. The long-term goal is 84.6. We're at 106.1, uh, basically. Uh, for multiracial students, 87.6, we're at 111. We're well above the long-term goals, and that's where we obviously want to stay in terms of that. And then you'll see some significant increases over here for some of our subgroup populations as well from this year to last. The final piece of the gap closing uh, graduation or um, gap closing component is graduation. Now here we're not going to have any subgroups because individual classes only have 200 kids, you're not going to have subgroups of 25 within that class. It's very rare that we have anything except all students and white non-Hispanic students as our two subgroups. Um, so we're going to, most of the time, be two out of 200 out of 200 in that particular section. They then take the percentages from all three of those areas, add them up together, and then divide by three. Something new this year is we have to show improvement with our English language and learners. The reason we get zero points there but it doesn't impact our grade is we don't have 25 English language learners in the district. Uh, that number, though, is going to decrease to 20 next year and 15 the year after that. And so we could see a report in the future where how well our English language learners uh, improve on the ELL that the test the state gives could be a factor in this particular component score. Right now, it's not. Uh, we are exempt from it. I think we had 15 total last year that took the assessment. And then finally, well, not finally. Uh, but the last piece of this is the prepared for success grade um, before we get to progress. This is the one we got a B in, so this is kind of how the state works. Uh, Jeff and I got an email that from the State Board of Education minutes, uh, meeting minutes, and it basically said um, that they were going to raise the passing score prepared for prepared for success from 90 to 93% because it just felt like it was right at the right time to do it. So it was a very arbitrary move. We actually went up from 90 to 91.4% in this. And this is based on these kids get honors diplomas when they graduate. Do they, are they remediation free on their ACT? Um, do they take AP classes and get a free on the test when they take it? You get points and bonus points for all those different scenarios. 
So we ended up 11th overall in the state. Our score went up 1.4%, but because the passage score is now 93, we got a B when last year we got an A when we were at 90%, and that was the A. Um, so we actually approved only nine districts in the state during the day. One little piece of data I pulled from this that I thought was interesting, we had the third highest percentage of our students that have remediation-free scores on the ACT and SAT in the state of Ohio, um, which I thought, you know, that's, for our students that go to um, state schools, they can walk in that knowing they're not going to take, you know, math and language arts courses that are below level 100, but they will actually get credit for graduation from those particular classes. Um, so we're doing better in this, well, it's something we'll look at. Um, in terms of trying to improve in this, but we did improve, it just improved enough to meet the new threshold. One of the things that I'll jump in, if you look at that industry recognized credential, that's a zero. I know Joyce Mullaney at, at CTEC is looking at that and advocating um, because that, that threshold doesn't necessarily align with how they issue credentials. Correct. And so she is trying to advocate for the methodology to align. <laughs> Um, because, you know, obviously you can see, you know, we sent 14 kids there and um, graduated, I think, seven last year and um, had a zero there. So she's working on that issue. And some of the things is that the credentials that they count are students who are eligible to take. Correct, exactly. So that's where the you can't take, you can't take uh, it. So if it's not. Right. Why would it not be eligible? Because they don't, they haven't had the, the education is it's beyond where they are in their in their um, career education. Okay. So it's meant for as you know, adult ed and beyond. Okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> And then finally, I, I will save this one for last. Progress, I think, is the most important and the only component that really um, is something that you can look at and say, okay, are you moving kids from point A to point B or beyond? And um, our progress growth, you can see we got an A in every single area. The different colors represent how much above or below average you are. Anything green is above average, anything yellow is right at average, and anything red is below average. We don't have a lot of red. Um, it's pretty much solid green across the board. And when you look at this holistically, our growth in the state was the best overall. So not only do we have high achievement, we have high growth amongst our students. And if you break that down further, our students with disabilities had the highest composite score for growth in the state. And our, our gifted students were 13th best in the state um, overall. So it's, it's a rare thing to have high achievement and high growth put a lot more stock into this piece than I do with the other components just because it shows that your students are progressing from an outside measure that we can develop on our own. Um, whether those tests are valid and so on and so forth, we can have a whole other long conversation about that. But our, our students are performing, and they're performing at a very high level, and they have for all three years that the new air test has been out. We've gotten an A every single year. This is the first time we've had an A all the way across the board like this. So there's the uh, wrap-up of our local report card. Before we get into the quality profile, do you have any questions about this? Anything that I wasn't clear on? Anything that you want some more clarification about? Ryan, it's probably unfair to ask since the changes tend to become arbitrary when the changes split. But if you look at this and try to project where it's going to be changed next year, how the cheese is going to be moved again? <laughs> We may have. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the end size going from 30 to 25 and next year from 25 down to 20, um, that may bring another subgroup or two into the conversation. That doesn't hurt us, though. I mean, I had mentioned to Jeff last year when they said it was going to go 30 to 25, I said, we're going to get three or four more subgroups. And I, that's okay. I mean, the more they want to measure us, we're going to, that's going to look very positive there just if we have the same level of of uh, performance by our students um, on those assessments. So um, that wasn't something that was really um, urgent in my mind in terms of in making any changes or anything. So I think that's going to be one change we know is coming. Prepared for success, that, like I said, that was a very arbitrary move. Um, I just don't know. I think eventually you know, they want to get to 100%. So that they can see, you know, every, equivalently, every student is now, your points match up one, one for one for every student, even though not every student gets a full point. <coughs> There's ways you can, there are things you can do in the district if you wanted to, to increase that number. For example, we could make every senior take the College Fed Plus English Language Arts course, but they all have to have senior English and do it in-house and so on and so forth. 
is that really what's best for kids? Maybe, maybe not. And then number two with that, that's going to be a significant cost to the district as well. So, um, but those things are in place around the state, and that's what some districts have decided to do in, in these situations. Um, we're going to let kids pick what classes they want to take. We have students that, you know, all they need is a social studies class to get the honors diploma. Uh, but they have an internship at a local business in the afternoon. You make them take the social studies class, or you let them go out and get the internship. It's an easy decision. And it's a decision that we have erred on the side of the student, probably to the detriment of this a little bit. Okay, so much more exciting than quality profile. So this is really hard, you know, I was, uh, when I was talking to Jeff about summarizing this, like what do you pull out of the quality profile? Because it's all good stuff. Um, but I wanted to pull out just a few things. First of all, for those of you who don't know what the quality profile is, um, it's a document that about 85 districts around the state put out. It's through the Alliance for High Quality Education. It's a group that uh, we are a part of. There are a lot of schools that have similar demographics to us, but also a lot of schools that just have similar interests. That education can be measured solely by this. Um, but there's a lot more that goes on in every school in the state that's much more important. You might want to say this is a grassroots effort to point out the good that happens in every school district across the state. And there are seven different sections of that. I pulled out a few things of the highlights that I thought were really special from this past season um, in those areas. First of all, Global Scholars Diploma. Now, we've talked about that before. We had 26 seniors, so that's over 10% of our senior class graduate with the Global Scholars Diploma. The previous year we had three or four. Um, so we're seeing exponential growth in that program. And in year four and five, you should start to see exponential growth in that program. Um, so they went through all three levels, made the presentation, and got the diploma from um, CCWA. From a PBL perspective, you know, we've talked extensively about um, that particular uh, initiative in our district. At GDS, the Kindergarten Hero Project, which I, which I know everybody heard about, and was an awesome project, and one of the reasons why you know, Mariah and Janine were here tonight. Second grade did a bee conservation project. Jeff and I got nice little baggies full of Save the Bee baggies on our desk one day that we were supposed to go home and plant the wildflowers and so forth. They didn't know what my green thumb was like or they wouldn't give me the bag, but we tried. But they, um, did, but they did write, don't eat this. Because <laughs> <laughs> they know we typically eat everything. Yeah. In sixth grade, GIS, they did the Genius Hour project. So every sixth grader chose something they were passionate about and they um, worked on that during their genius hour at the end of the day, certain days of the week, and then they had a huge presentation to friends and family at the end of the year. At the middle school, the eighth grade science class worked very closely with the uh, National Transportation Safety Board, and they designed cars that were safer. They had to go down this ramp, and they crashed into things, and they put eggs in there, and things had to break. And, uh, but they actually worked with the engineers um, and scientists from that safety board, and the winners uh, we're supposed to go there, but got, we actually got the two days we had off were both days they were supposed to go there. So I don't know, Lisa, did they were actually get to go no, there? No, they didn't. So, but the good thing is, um, the scientists there, the one who worked with us again this year is great. And then at the high school, um, you know, you have the Global Awareness Project. Every senior is involved in a Global Awareness Project. And the amazing thing about that is when, when we ask the seniors, you know, tell me about the project, they don't talk about Oh, I learned so much about this country. Uh, they, you know, they talk about working with other students. They talk about developing empathy for, you know, uh, working with somebody from another country and, and almost having the having the confidence to say this is a problem in that com in that country. This is a way I think you can solve it. But then listening to feedback from the people who have lived there or have been there over time. Uh, it's an amazing project, and it's really grown over uh, you know, the last four or five years under Matt's uh, guidance. And then the land lab expansion in collaboration with fourth grade science classes. So we know we expanded the land lab, but now fourth grade science classes are making kiosks with information that so when you walk around, you, can, you don't know what you're looking for, you can help you know what you're looking for as you go through the land lab. And our tech classes are building the, uh, the actual structures for those kiosks. You know, the fine and performing arts of all grades, we could have a 30 minute presentation on just that section alone. Um, 90% of our students in, at the high school are involved in a club or a sport or activity. Um, that's an amazing number, and it does not happen everywhere. The athletics, we had the indoor practice facility, we had nine LCL titles, um, which is a lot. <laughs> Usually it's three or four every year. Um, and then some other things happened. We had Denison students from a community perspective. We had 16 different Denison students come to 
uh, read to our students to support literacy at GES. Look at all the partnerships that we have with different groups. I mean, when you start reading that name, you, you've had presentations here of what those groups have done uh, to support students and staff in our schools. We looked at mental, mental and physical safety of our students. We had some safety upgrades, we are accredited heart safe again, and we had mental first aid training for a, a vast majority of our staff. A clean audit is always a good thing for the treasurer's office. I know Mike's very proud of that, he should be. Uh, we offered free summer literacy invention to over 100 students this year between Title I services and extended uh, school year services. And then we had positive behavioral intervention systems at all schools this past year. So there's a lot of good things going that you don't see here uh, that I think are more important than state test scores, and that's certainly my opinion, but I think it's the opinion of a lot of us hold in this room as well. And that is the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. So one of the things that I'll, I'll mention um, is at the August uh, Linton County kickoff meeting, uh, they hosted a panel of students that just graduated from all the Lincoln County schools. And our student that was there talked extensively about their experiences in Granville schools, but also about their project-based learning experiences. And not only did they talk, they were extremely articulate about what the takeaways were. Um, you know, Ryan mentioned empathy, talked about the collaboration, the networking, the ability to persevere through challenges and difficulties. All the outcomes that we want our students to experience, this student referenced. And when he finished, three or four people on the panel said, I think that's why Granville does what they do. Because we didn't have that experience. And I thought that was really telling. Um, now, I think that that's important, but it's also important that we talk about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So some of this you know, this work starts to proliferate others, other districts. That's why we, we work with several, several other districts in a, you know, the um, PBL cohort and the SOAR network. And, um, and I think it's something that really separates us from a lot of school districts, and that's why parents want their, their students educated in Granville schools. So, very positive, anecdotal. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic results every year. I'm really so proud of things like that. And we can find ways to keep them out in front of the community as well, right? And, and find ways to show this. It's meaningful for people. Uh, the, the numbers are easy, right? And are wonderful and always show good, but they're really the core of it is in all the other stuff that we do that doesn't show up in those numbers. And it's, a, it's kind of a longer story, but it's the important one that I hope comes out through our communications and how we respond to questions. I agree. I, I think in many ways that that quality profile is our response to the preparation for success measure. Mm -hmm. Because those things you pointed to, Ryan, you highlighted in, in many of the other um, programs that you didn't even have time to mention. Those to me are all go, go, what goes into defining uh, or preparing students for success when they do that. I say that having the benefit of having three kids who graduated from here and have gone on and have just been um, through through the education you receive, you've been extraordinarily well prepared uh, to, to work with others, to find opportunities to collaborate, to, uh, to develop relationships. It's all of those, what we might call soft factors, that aren't really soft factors, the factors are actually essential factors in preparing students for success that, uh, that are reflected there. So to me, that's what, that, that's what speaks volumes about what we're doing. Thank you very much. Okay, so next, uh, time is going to come up and talk a little bit about facilities. As you know, we have a 20-year facility plan uh, that is um, currently underfunded by about $500,000 annually. Um, one of the things that we had to do uh, in May, obviously we addressed the $640,000 uh, that we needed to address in the operating budget. Uh, through the reduction in force and some of the pay uh, or fees instituted and payment um, 
convenience fees being shifted back to the parents, but another aspect of what we had to do was look at our facility plan and what we were going to plan on deferring maintenance on because we were going to be you know, not able to spend that much money out of our, our capital budget as well. So um, we wanted Tanya to come and talk a little bit about you know, what's in that 20-year plan, but also what we deferred this year, and then some of the things that we accomplished over the summer from the facilities and operations standpoint. And here's we that. sound in my presentation, so. <coughs> really? Yes. That's something that I didn't realize. Yeah. <laughs> I did not hear that. show you how to use the, the devices. Um, so each room has that box 
next to the door with the device. You just slide it in to the bottom and your door is barricaded. So it's that easy to use. And um, my understanding of and all the feedback that I've received from everyone is that they are very uh, happy and pleased to have those in their classroom. So that's been um, a great addition to our school buildings. <coughs> We were also uh, able to purchase 26 additional two-way radios uh, to bring our total of two-way radios for communications um, in the district to 46. Uh, the new radios actually allow us to communicate across the district, so we can be at the elementary school and actually speak to people at the intermediate school um, using the two-way radios, which is, is new for us over the past couple of years. Um, that allows us to obviously tell everyone in the district at one time of the situation that may be um, up here. In fact, earlier this year, we actually used them to see if everyone's electricity was out. So, you know, it used for a variety of things, but definitely in an emergency situation, they can come in handy. Uh, those two-way radios don't depend on Wi-Fi, self-service, or even having electricity. Um, this year, we also had to put new uh, pay systems in our intermediate school and elementary school. Uh, we just couldn't hear in some areas of the buildings. We also did install citizen aid wall packs. We have eight in the district, and they are placed at cur uh, currently at the locations next to the AEDs in each building. We also ended our radon testing, and we installed some mitigation devices. Um, both, there were two areas in the district that needed mitigation devices. They were both in the areas of storage closets or storage rooms. Um, one area was in the intermediate school. Um, in some rooms adjacent to the library, and the other area was a storage room um, inside the industrial tech room. Key scan system, that's the automated door system that we have uh, that controls our door locks. That system was upgraded to a Nora soft software program, and um, the old system was just basically, it was just not reliable. It was leaving doors open when they shouldn't have been, um, or locking them when they should have been unlocked. So. That is, is working out well as we continue to learn that system. So, Tanya, if I can just clarify, so every classroom in, this, in each of the four buildings now has a barricading device, whether it's whether it's the Night straps drop. or yes, okay. that's correct. Are there technical difficulties? On on the automated door locking software upgrade, yes. um, and I'm disclose everything they do for good reason, but essentially that that's a monetary system for all exterior doors. Yes. And can can alert someone if an exterior door is blocked open. Correct. Not secure the shut. Yes. Yes. Okay, summer projects. We have um, completed some concrete and asphalt repairs across the district. We have also added um, an ADA compliance sidewalk for the softball and soccer area. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are doing some roof repairs right now at the middle school and high school. The kitchen at the high school has a walk-in freezer and a uh, dishwasher. The grounds crew laid uh, 3,800 square feet of sod in the soccer field to fill in areas by the goal mount in the center of the field. <coughs> uh, the motor lift of the station at GIS was replaced. We've also moved to a new management system for our scheduling purposes for field trips and maintenance requests. It's called Facilities Management Exchange, FMX. It replaced school noon. That's actually a cost savings to the district and is much more user friendly, both on um, the user side, like all of the staff, and then also on the administrative uh, side, writing reports to look at what is going on with work orders, um, schedule requests, and whatnot. So it's, it's nice. Of course, there was a little bit of learning curve, but we are um, moving along quite well. We also um, replaced two rooftop units, one at the elementary school and one at GHS. And then we made some repairs to our football, the bleachers of the football field. Um, we replaced some boards and we also put some rail in that to make those safe. So that concludes my presentation. Do you have any questions for me? So in terms of the deferred maintenance issues, mm -hmm. uh, how are you looking at that for um, for the coming year? Um, obviously, with a million dollar maintenance budget and ma identified maintenance needs that exceed a million dollars a year, mm -hmm. you have the same amount of money to work with, presumably finding other things.
things that have to, that, that can be or that we would have to defer in the coming years. And then we, we use, and can you tell us a little bit about how you're sort of ranking those priorities? So are the things, the half million dollar projects that were deferred this year, are they assured that they're going to be done next year or, that, or can they get pushed down the road? Well, we are pushing things down the road as we can. I and mean, basically, it's, it's safety um, that comes first, what we're prioritizing. Um, and then those items that we need to, to function um, you know, in the building so that this, the climate is um, safe and secure and, and comfortable. And the HVAC, you know, we can't push those down the road too, too long. That doesn't work very well. It, it seems to, to be we're in the situation where something that is close to end of life ends life <laughs> and and then it becomes a must replace yeah. versus a you know a potential part of the, the main maintenance plan um, so we are getting caught in that trap right now and uh, so one of the things that we we didn't even reference there is you know our furniture replacement, mm -hmm. but we didn't we, we didn't replace any of the furniture. Um, the one thing that I was surprised by in uh, coming to Granville is, is is it seems like most of the furniture was potentially donated at some level from some other vendor or like State Farm or something like that. Um, I know some came from a community college. It, the, the district never really truly invested much in furniture acquisition. And, uh, and I know for a fact that when GIS was built, very little furniture was actually acquired through that bond process, um, which is atypical um, for, for school districts when they're doing that type of work. Um, so that we didn't even reference that, but those are the things that we're constantly dealing with that are kind of smaller in scale. But those things build up, um, and you don't really want kids falling on the floor, or, you know, their desk falling apart right in front of them. Well, relative to defraying some mechanical costs and things like HVAC, you know, in the past I thought, oh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But in reality, my experience with industrial management of facilities is that you end up with equipment that's less efficient, right, and you end up putting more belts and time and fixing and band-aids, right? And so if you look at the overall system cost and how you most effectively run that you know, big, big organization like this, you really got to stay on top of that stuff. It seems like, oh, it's okay, it didn't break yet, right? And maybe it won't for a year. But in reality, you're paying more for it, right? And it's like, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of connect with that, right? That like, oh my gosh, you, we, we don't need it. Well, let's get it done. We really do. You have to stay on this plan, right? And that's a risk, right? And the risk is it's going to go bad in the middle of winter. Right? And then, you know, you've got disruption and then you've got more cost because everybody needs a new furnace in the winter and, you know, it's, it's just more problems. So I hope we can find a way to get on top of this. <laughs> um, and that will lead to some of our further discussions, I'm sure. So. No, I think it's essential. I mean, you know, um, everything that we have, whether it's a desk or a boiler or air conditioner or something else, has a useful life. And uh, as Thomas indicated, it's always more effective, efficient, and less expensive in the long run to replace things on a schedule than have to replace things on an emergency basis. Yep. You know, and, and there's all, there are always things that we don't anticipate, like the fire yeah. uh, sprinkler safety system at the high school it turned out to be an urgent repair this year. So um, it's, you end up spending more in the long run if we can't have a uh, consistent maintenance and update. And we've, we've never had, for as long as I've been in this district, we've never had uh, you know, luxurious facilities. I don't think anybody here has called for that. I don't think uh, any, anybody has urged that. But we need to make sure that we, that we have safe, a safe and comfortable environment to, uh, so we can learn and protect students. Thank you for what you're doing. And you're stretching every dollar as far as you can, <laughs> sometimes farther than you can. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, you get to hear from me on the first reading of some policies. So uh, this summer, the General Assembly was active. Uh, they passed a couple of bills that were, will require us to um, update our policies. And um, 
So uh, I'm going to kind of walk through some of these, but really just to give you a sense of what is part of this uh, update. Um, there is some recommendations basically coming out of, honestly, lawsuits and litigation related to crowdfunding. Um, and so we're going to touch on that in a little bit. Um, new requirements for uh, district credit cards, that's coming out of the Attorney General's office and the Auditor's office. Um, guidance on federal procurement. Um, House Bill 318 was passed and that really looked at positive behavioral intervention supports uh, and suspensions and expulsions and it put some limitations on what uh, discipline you could render for kids under the uh, grade three and below. Um, how, uh, Senate Bill 216 was the Ohio uh, Schools Deregulation Act and it had multiple, uh, we called it a Christmas tree bill um, because it had multiple ornaments that are uh, byproducts that will address our uh, policies in the future. And then there are a couple of other things related to changes in um, OHSAA regulations that um, uh, affect transfer bylaws. So those are embedded in here as well. So I'm just going to kind of walk through some of these. Um, and and they're going, it's going to be brief, but I want you to just be aware of it. Um, the minutes policy is really just um, when the, the board president signs the, the minutes, um, it's not a form of any action except for just documenting that the board president has seen the minutes. Um, so apparently there was some litigation related to that. Um, school board legal status, uh, we're just updating our policies to make sure that we what include Grable exempted school districts and the fact that we're represented by five elected board members, so we'll include that. Um, the uh, budget planning process, that is related to the five-year forecast. Um, some legislation was passed and uh, the October forecast can now, um, after this October, be done in by November 30th. Because a lot of people were changing their five-year forecast and then the November election was taking place and then they had to update their October forecast. So they just said, why don't we make the forecast due by November 30th? So they passed that legislation. Mike, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, they, it doesn't take effect though until November of 19. Uh, uh, the uh, purchasing of, um, <coughs> the purchasing policy is just giving a limit to what generic supplies can be bought up to a dollar amount, and that dollar amount for us is $5,000, which is a blanket purchase order that cannot extend beyond the current fiscal year. So it's basically just creating limits. It's um, actually loosening limits. It's actually oh, it is? loosening. Oh. From the current limits, that is by quarter instead of by fiscal year, which is kind of silly. Um, so it's just making it a being able to do it, and then you have to go where you can open five thousand dollars. You can think that's all year instead of having to close it every quarter. We open a new one. Okay. Um, I skipped over the federal uh, grants funds administration. That's just to change uh, to some language that the records are sufficient to verify that the time spent in compensation were allocated to the correct fund um, for federal guidance or federal uh, fund allocation, and some date changes. Um, the bidding requirement, uh, there's some permissive language, and all purchases over $25,000 except for state term um, should come to the board. We've been doing that on a regular basis, so that's not anything different. Um, we've kept that at $25,000. Petty cash, uh, I'm getting to that. Um, is also related to the debit and credit accounts and um, so there is 
a change in what the language as far as how that needs to be monitored. And it really is, like Mike said, we don't have those accounts. So it's a change, but it's not a change to our practice because we don't have them. Okay. Uh, let's see, fitting requirements I talked about, purchasing procedures. Um, that is more of a regulation than the policy. And um, it, we have to identify the number of vendors that we uh, select bids from and uh, get um, the, the federal procurement process from. And we have identified that that is three vendors. Um, and my, that's not really an issue either because that's for using federal funds to buy things and we generally do not use federal funds to buy anything. We usually only use federal funds for either either salaries or some purchase services for PD. Mike, do you want to address credit cards? The credit card policy came out of some, I think, some issues that have been going on in different places around the state from the auditor. Um, where a lot of what we have to do is actually what we do in practice right now anyway. Um, you have two choices of how to do it. Either the treasurer's office can control all the credit cards or the, it can be decentralized. The buildings can control them with credit limits and specific definitions of who's allowed to use them and what they're allowed to be used for. Most of the changes that are in the policies are things that we are already um, doing. Um, you know, we have a, we already have a defined credit limit for what can be on any card. Um, that won't change. Part of the problem is there's some version of the language that I thought didn't make sense given what the route we're trying to do. And I've been mean, working trying to get some clarification from OSPA to drafting this on how receipts are. The, the, the process they have for receipts doesn't really make sense if you choose the option of not having the card centrally located. Um, having the card centrally located would be um, probably not a great idea in the way we operate. Um, it would be very dislocating um, as far as efficiency. Um, but we've not had any issues um, yet. Some of the other things as far as if a card is compromised, you need to... We have not issue. We've had cards compromised a couple times. We find out about it almost immediately and get them canceled. Um, so again, those are not, those haven't been issues as far as we're concerned. Mike, how frequently were you using credit cards as opposed to the previous? We use credit cards quite a bit. A lot of it, I mean, that's the big thing is, you know, we've moved more and more towards purchasing stuff on Amazon. Um, and Amazon does not take purchase orders. Um, so pretty much everything that we have to do with Amazon is by credit card. Um, we also um, get, we, we do not allow the use of PayPal uh, because that, the one or two times that that has happened, it has caused nightmares. Um, you trying to get things straightened out because nobody is quite responsible for it. And so, you know, where a lot of times you use PayPal, we're using credit card because we don't need PayPal because it just hasn't worked using it. And we haven't done PayPal very often. And we've had problems when we have. So we, pretty much don't do that anymore. Um, and then there are just other things where it, they could be, it's just more convenient to use the credit card. We probably average, we, uh, Tina's been, we spend maybe about $50,000 on average, you know. Each month, yeah. Probably a month on credit cards across the district. You know, some are less, some more, depending on when during the year. Uh, first aid, food sales, wellness program, all of those are related to a new requirement that we have to submit um, annually to, uh, through the consolidated report to ODD, information related to training and uh, our food sales program and our student wellness program. Uh, so those are all required, required to change because we have to embed that November 30th uh, report into those policies. Um, again, we're doing all of those things. Now we just have to report them to the state. Thank you very much. Um, 
the personnel policies, um, professional staff contracts, uh, professional hiring of staff in House Bill or Senate Bill 216, they changed the language from highly qualified teacher to professionally licensed staff. So anywhere it's referenced in those policies as highly qualified teacher, it's now professionally certified staff. Um, staff gifts and solicitations and student fundraising, those are both related to crowdfunding. Um, Mike, do you want to reference the crowdfunding policy and, and <laughs> Um, we're going to, we are going to align it to our current uh, fundraising policy. So there is a process that everybody has to go through to get permission to fundraise. There's no difference for the crowdfunding. It has to go through my, the building, myself, and finally Mike in order to approve it. So there's going to be rigorous uh, checks and balances so that we don't have teachers just putting things out online saying, I want to do this, fund me. Because then once that happens, where does that money go? Does it ever come through the board? Those types of things have happened in other locations. And so, you know, we, we want, you know, projects to be able to be funded, but they need to go through our fundraising activities process. So does that extend um, beyond the classroom to, you know, clubs and Team sports and team. that and that is currently part of our student fundraising activities. All the, the activities that people do fundraising around. Okay. Yep. What kind of things typically don't go through that in the past? What kinds of issues have we had, or how was this policy going to clean that up? Is it kind of the, like the team wants to sell more candy bars, or is it? No, as a matter of fact, we've we've, a, we've actually, actually had requests request for GoFundMe accounts at times, and we've denied them, um, and and we've worked with like the Education Foundation or some other organizations that are support organizations, PTO, to get those fund, the funding for those projects. Um, another perfect example that, of what, it, what could have been used um, to do, or, or a way to fund a project, the, the platform out of GIS. Uh, it's a project that the Environmental Science Group has taken up. They've been working with Terra Nova Builders. Um, they've gotten revenue from uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they've received money from Lincoln County Soil and Water and some other vendors um, that have supported the, the funding of that, that project. Um, again, all that came through my office, but in some circumstances, those things in other districts have been put out on social media to fund with very little checks and balances of where that revenue goes once it's identified. So does that help? help? give you a, at least a little bit of an example. We, we try to avoid any direct sales um, through that student fundraising. Um, you know, maybe pencils that they sell in the school or things like that, but we try and avoid um, anything that's going to require a student to go door to door um, and solicit funds for people that they're not familiar with. I think it's just a balance to make sure we don't shut off any potential streams of support that would come from other avenues and things like that, and that we're open to finding ways to help those happen easily and quickly for a teacher or a team or something like that, right? And so hopefully it's not too onerous of a process, but that it's appropriately monitored. Yeah. And, and it, it was clunky at first, um, but I feel like people have gotten used to following the process. Occasionally, we have to remind somebody that there is a process because um, they're unfamiliar, or they're new, and um, you know they forget. Uh, Interscholastic activities um, and interdistrict open enrollment. So, uh, as you know, Granville does not offer open enrollment opportunities, um, and we include that into our interdistrict open enrollment policy, but also in our scholastic policy. Um, because there has been kind of an opening of a door related to athletics um, and, and people's ability to participate in the school district even if they're not enrolled, homeschool students and some other uh, examples, which we do allow that if they are residents of the school district, um, homeschool, they can participate in our activities. Um, but if they, let's say they go to GCA but they live in Johnstown, 
um, and GCA doesn't offer the sport, they cannot participate in our sports. Um, it is residence based only. So we've adjusted that. Um, the other change in interscholastic activities was uh, the transfer rule that aligns with changes that the OHA, OHSAA have identified, which really, I think the main shift is moving from a year to 50%, correct? Um, second half of the year. Second half of the year, yes. Yeah. From a transfer standpoint. Okay. Um, so then we get into <coughs> hazing, bullying, and harassment of weapons in school, student discipline, student suspension, emergency removal of student, student expulsion. All of those relate to House Bill 318 and the fact that if a child is under the age of third grade or below, um, under the grade, third grade or below, they cannot be um, suspended or expelled um, for certain circumstances. So um, that is a change. Senator Lehner was very passionate about that bill um, and received a lot of support in the, um, in the uh, legislature for that, and it has now passed. Um, there are other aspects to that bill, but that is probably the most important because it impacts all those different references in the policies. Um, Weapons in schools, the only nuance is that um, a knife is defined as a cutting instrument that has a sharp blade that is capable of causing serious bodily injury. Um, they have added that in um, to the, uh, to the policy. Okay. Um, let's see, student suspension, caution, physical examination of students, it's really the search and seizure. Um, Oh, no, that's physical examinations. Okay, um, so the district has the requirement to screen hearing, vision, speech, and communications. Um, and so we have to do that now by November 1st. So there's a deadline for when we have to, to do those types of screenings. And that also relates to our November 30th reporting requirement to ODB. So that is part of what we currently do. Um, it's just a little tighter time. Uh, because they want to, they, they could and they want us to report on it. How's that for a great answer? Um, and then there were some um, additional uh, aspects related to our emergency and safety plans because those plans evolve literally every single day. Um, and so we have to put those things into those policies. So the new policy recommendation is for the online fundraising campaigns to align with our current um, student fundraising policy. So that language will align with, its, with the other policy that I referenced. And then there is, uh, with the addition of the credit card policy, we're going to have to remove the uh, regulations for credit cards and replace it with the new policy. Okay? Any questions? The good news is that a lot of the things that I just referenced, we already do from a, a practical standpoint. Um, we're just changing policy to align with that. But as you can see, this was the result of the work that the General Assembly did this summer. So, questions, <laughs> comments? <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll hold back. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, do you have a clicker? Yeah. You can turn that off. Okay. All right, thank you for that report. Uh, we've now come to the portion of our agenda which is reserved for public comments. Uh, if there uh, anyone who would like to make a comment, uh, we would ask you to step to the podium and state your name and address. And Share your thoughts with us. Seeing none, <laughs> we'll close the public comment uh, and move on to board discussion. Um, we have three items I think that we 
you get the uh, outline for board discussion, uh, uncollected lunch fees, the levy, and the uh, and the CEDA must have and must and wants. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we do uncollected lunch fees and the CEDA first, and then reserve the levy discussion. Okay. Because I think uh, at least for uh, for both the lunch fees and the CEDA, we need to uh, for some yes for provide an update. Mike is going to talk about uncollected lunch fees. Uncollected lunch fees has been an issue for several years now. Um, we have probably eight to ten thousand um, dollars of uncollected fees. Some of that will probably never be collected because it's students who have left the district, but others of it are students who are still here. Um, the difficult part of this is the feds are. Uh, yeah, we have to come up with a new policy on how we're going to deal with it. But the feds have also outlined things you're not allowed to do as part of that policy, which makes it really difficult to then implement something that you can do. Um, and so, yeah, this has been an ongoing discussion as to, you know, how do we cut student, yeah, basically not, yeah, not allow students to buy anything anymore. And, you know, it's been an ongoing discussion. Like we had a discussion probably about two or three years ago. Um, on how to handle that. I don't think we have a result how to handle that. Uh, so the reality is we're trying to yeah. minimize the impact to students right. and compel the parents to pay their obligation. And that is a challenge because um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the child can be accruing additional charges above and beyond the required meal, like the a la carte uh, items and things like that. So trying to impact or, or change their their behavior but not notifying them is a challenge um, and then you know how do we compel parents and, and notify them um, when we send home multiple messages to the parents and we get very little response on a regular basis <laughs> to be clear when you have outstanding balances you also point out to the parents the availability of Reduce free and reduced yep. lunch every single time. Just an First application has to be filled out. Uh, and so you're, you're talking about folks who don't avail themselves of that service, um, yet don't, don't pay for lunch. Correct. And we generally send the forms with the notification <coughs> for the free and reduced application. And I, and I recognize you've always been reluctant, I think appropriately so, uh, to put the student in a bad position. Something in a situation which could, could cause embarrassment or could cause them to just not want to get lunch, which is clearly not what we want to cut. And the feds have actually said you can't. Right. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. When the kid gets to the end of the line and they have something and they have a balance, you can't say no. You can't have that here. You have to take this. And, and the feds have kind of said you can't. You can't do that. So is it, is it, and we may not know this, but is it your sense that at least some of this outstanding balance is um, it's, it's less related to an ability to pay and more related to at least a lack of willingness to pay? That is our view on, on, a, on a significant portion of it, yes. And then, so what's the reference to the new federal requirements? Impose upon us an obligation to pursue the payment. It's a to develop a policy about how you are going to pursue payment um, but, with but, the limitations that they have put on the things you cannot do to get paid. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we are right now, um, struggling with how you do one without doing the other. So, so this is probably parents who are have an ability to pay, but just choose not to for whatever reason, right? Is, is, and the students are aware of this? Is it your sense that the students are aware and complicit with this? Like, I don't even know how to go after it, given the handcuffs were put on us, right? Like, I don't know how we to don't these messages to have, have any idea. Uh, most likely not. <coughs> not. Or uh, certainly not the younger ones. Right. Yes, hopefully not. Um, but again, you know, when you're looking at the budget, 
you know, ten thousand dollars potentially over a five-year lifespan, that's or a five-year cycle, that's fifty thousand dollars. That's that's not an insignificant amount of money. Um, you know, at one point we talked about do we you know try and go to a collection agency, and after certain notifications, you send you know the collection agency out to, to try and collect funds. Um, there are a variety of different ways. We're not being very successful with our current methodology, which is notify, 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 and then notify again. So if a student gets to the cash register and they don't have money, they're not told they don't have money? No. The child seems to know that it's going to count as well. Mm -hmm. um, he comes home and tells me, mom, you want money. They they are they're told that they are getting low or below zero. They probably get a balance, right? Do they not have a balance? I don't I don't know if they get a balance when it pops up. They they can probably look at the screen. I don't know that any of them look at the screen, but we also have access to the parent portal. Yeah. Students do. Okay. But they're not going to like it. None of them, they just punch in their code and go. They don't look at the screen to see how much money. Is they there a way to tell us to so like that? Well. It would yeah. show up, like, so it would show up on the screen. screen. Oh, it would be on the screen, but I would say my kid knows. they don't. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, might look. they might. So yeah. some look, some don't. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I think the the majority of yeah. He follows the book. Okay. I wonder if we can almost do some yeah. polling. <laughs> By instead of just sending a letter, making some phone calls, not like people send phone calls, but you know, if it's the school district's calling, you know, from the office, it might be interesting just to understand, like, were you aware, right? And if they snicker a little bit, and then that's one response, right? But they're like, oh, really? I didn't know, right? Because I never checked her. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it'd be, and it might be interesting because I mean, apparently letters don't work, right? And, and I've heard people snicker a little bit about like, oh, it seems like they don't really do anything and wouldn't have a balance. So I've kind of heard that out of people tell me that they heard people say, <laughs> right? And I'm not sure how to break through that. And that, you know, I'm reporting to credit agencies and getting debt collectors and things like that involved seems a little silly for a $5 overdraw, right? But there's probably some bigger ones as well, right? That might be at least worse, like calling and mentioning to the folks that, you know, this is, would be our next step and make sure that they hear that next step because they obviously are not getting letters and so forth. I guess I wouldn't be completely opposed to that. I mean, that's not something that we want to be in the center of, and certainly not something that's actually financially all that beneficial, because it probably costs more to go out and get those guys than it does, like, the money you're going to get out of it. But we somehow have to fix the system, right, and make folks aware that this is an issue, and that we actually need to pay the bills. We have an amount of money that we're in arrears. Can you give us a sense of what percentage of the student population that might be present? And whether this is in arrears for a long period of time, or is there a rolling plan? A lot of it is a rolling plan. I think the, the percentage of the population where it's a chronic, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, large number is pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, probably a, maybe a couple dozen. Um, there generally it tends to be a little bit more of a rolling thing. Uh, it's, just a, it, it's, it's a chronic, you know, it's some, is it a chronic 40 or $50 or is it a chronic $300? Mike, you, you mentioned uh, some of these kids about the school's graduate perhaps have gone on, so those are probably kind of collect. So, I know this from experience. When the child loses a library book, <laughs> there's an economic consequence to that, um, which has to be cleared up before they graduate and get their report card. And maybe if they're a senior, maybe it's before they graduate and get their diploma. I don't know if that's the case or not. But is there a similar pattern that we could follow? <coughs> for some of the and, and Ryan, you'd have to help me with this, but I don't know that we're allowed to hold diplomas. There was a change several years ago, and I, I, I would have to check on that. Yeah. And, and I, don't, I haven't experienced the diploma issue. 
Report card. But then again, you know, maybe that's less important. That's where the grades are also available. Well, see, we can hold withhold the report cards, but it's outlined. That's right. So okay. people, the impact is the transcripts. Point. Though transcripts are. Yeah. Transcripts. And you can also make them so they won't be allowed to participate in the ceremony. Yeah. You know that way. I mean, if you've got a, a younger student in the situation, you may have a long ways to go before you get that. Maybe that's not effective. Yeah, I have a sense more of the uncollectible. It's really not necessarily kids who have graduated, but families that have left the district. So from a from an accounting perspective, ought we not to just write that off, take it off our books, and declare, point, declare it as uncollectible? At some point, yeah, we probably should. I think that would probably the board would need to kind of take action declaring it. Do you have a sense of what percentage of that? I haven't looked, I think the, it's been a while since I've looked at that. At the last time I looked, I think it was about 20% of it that was kids who are, who are no longer here. But I, I, I have not looked at that more recently. Right. It's easy enough to do. Of, of the remaining 80%, you said some of it rolls, how much rolls just slowly and how much just doesn't really well, I, give or take? I'm probably going to have to look at that again to okay. see, to, to do the math on that. I think what we really just wanted to get a sense of, like, you know, what are some of the absolutely don't do this um, from the boards? Because we're going to have to go and craft this policy. And, and so we want to bring maybe several different ways that we go about this and then give you an opportunity to adjust the policy at the during the first, after the first reading. So we're really just trying to get a sense of your appetite for, you know, how far on the aggression scale do you want us to be? I think the policy could be more open, but the application of it is like dependent on, again, you're not gonna call it credit agency if they're five bucks over, right? That's right. right. But we should make sure that we give you that latitude if there is somebody that's, you know, obviously able to pay it from your perspective, and I'm not sure how you do that, right? But not so interested in the willing, right? So I think giving you latitude in the policy and entrusting you to implement it appropriately is the best way to do the policy. And again, you know, reporting to credit agencies or going to a debt collector or whatever is a pretty significant deal, right? And not when you're going to do for small dollars, but when we might as well keep in there for the case that there is somebody that's a thousand bucks over and doesn't happen to feel like paying, you know? And I'm not sure if that's going to get traction either, but you know, I'm not sure what other avenue we have. So I'm like, I'm hearing maybe some threshold then yeah. is yeah. like if it's yeah. above 200. Yeah, I, mean, we know, I think we can also have <coughs> the option of turning it over to the Attorney General for collection, and, and that involves putting a lien on property. <laughs> do, do we know or can we find out? So I like the idea of holding the transcripts. If it's a family, if they have an older sibling that's looking at college, and if they're not, I mean, I don't want to threaten anybody, but it's going to affect, you know, big brother or sister if they have multiple children in the, in the school system that are in, their, in arrears on what they own.
<laughs> Glenn, Glenn will look <laughs> into something like that. I don't know. I mean, just, it's, yes, like our, our current notification methods are not working. Right? Yeah. You know, right. And I don't know what else. But, but also, if you have a, a mid screen pop up that says, you know, if you don't want to be investigated by credit agencies, please let your pay your bill. You know, I don't know. Blocking your record. Send out letter after letter after letter. We've people made phone calls. Made phone calls. Yes, we have. Okay. You, you get a response. People, yeah. Just mm -hmm. acknowledgement. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. That's good. Yeah. 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 Or you leave messages and they don't. Right. Yeah. You never hear back from them. <laughs> some version of a policy to you for a first brief. Um, if you just wanted to get a sense of your, your perspective. You, you know my view would be, uh, we publish the names in our local newspaper, but that would, uh, that would violate the privacy issue for the respect of students, and I don't want to embarrass the spirit. That's what we take pains to do. Uh, just, it's a parent's obligation. I like to keep the parents and step up. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. CETA must-haves and wants. Okay. So several weeks ago, uh, I participated in a meeting uh, related to the CETA or, or GED development um, or the MOU with the township and the village related to the 16th corridor in uh, how to uh, create a joint um, collaborative agreement to develop an economic development area. Um, one of the tasks that the group assigned was to have each entity go back and talk about what are their must-haves, um, what are their barriers. Uh, for us, you know, if you're thinking about the development of a corridor, a couple of things come to mind as far as must-haves or, or desires. Um, one, I think it's important for us to have, you know, a, a seat at the table. Um, if they create some type of um, uh, development board uh, that would, you know, give us a potential seat at the table, just like we have a seat at the zoning um, and planning commission boards. Um, the other thing that you need to consider is thinking about, you know, the type of limited development that we would be, you know, willing to accept or, or, you know, obviously we don't want a bunch of residential development out there. I think the, the comprehensive plan has identified that as a business economic development corridor and we don't want to have a lot of new homes going in there because that would require us or actually strap our facilities to the point where that would be detrimental to the school district. Uh, but we want to, you know, phrase it however we want to phrase it. Um, but I think minimal to limited uh, econ or, uh, residential growth would be probably something that we would need to embed in there as well. Uh, the other thing that you should think about is you know, financing. You know, typically these projects require some type of uh, tax incremental financing um, in their construction. So what are you willing to potentially agree to from a short-term tip um, or payment in lieu of taxation, some type of structure that you would be interested in. Um, Mike, what else am I not saying that I should? I think those are really the main, the main things is our, the seat at the table, you know, the three you mentioned, I think are the primary ones that I think we need to be on board for. They need to be on board for us for. Yeah, it's it's great group to be involved in this process, and thank you for sitting on that board. I think it's a good, good one for our community, and it's fantastic that so far, you know, it's it's getting some traction. I see where it goes. You know, I, I would think that our continued involvement will be much better, right? So that seat at the table is really important. 
relative to residential development. I, I guess it doesn't seem to me that's a prime residential development area, right? And that's not really uh, something that we have a control over relative to the other areas. Like in the rest of the township, we don't necessarily have that authority to say no residential development to some extent. So I would think that it would be important, just as we do with you know the planning commission, that we stay involved. And I think that's our key to ensuring that the development that happens is positive and productive for our community and sustainable balance of you know, residential and, and business development and so forth. And I'm not sure how to phrase that within there. I think that's going to be important to craft that so it's maybe not authoritatively restrictive, but you know, clear about what our requirements are, what is beneficial to the school district and therefore the community from an overall tax base. I think you could you can phrase it from the standpoint of aligning it to the comprehensive plan. Yeah, that's a great point. Because yeah. the comprehensive plan clearly identifies yeah. that as a, as a business corridor. Yep. And so if you if you align your recommendation with the comprehensive plan language, I think you're sending a clear message of what it is the intent of that land usage is. And, um, and I think you get there. Without necessarily strong arming, we don't want you know, any residential. I would disagree with you. That land would be very advantageous uh, yeah, yeah. To, to residential growth. So mm -hmm. I think we have to, it's something that we absolutely need to address in our recommendations back to. Um, I think the services are there, you're saying? Or yeah. You oh, yeah, they have, to, they have to plug in sewer and water, but that's really what the whole thing is all about. Right? Yeah. Right. yeah. And you have a potentially a contamination issue on the, on the property, but sure, you know, for a certain amount of money. Uh, I see. So it's seated at the table. The other, so I, I mentioned financing um, because typically when you you look at a project like this, there is some type of tip involved um, or a tax abatement or something like that. Um, you know, from an infrastructure standpoint, what we're trying to do is put water, sewer, and you know, at least conduit for the fiber uh, infrastructure. They they identified that this would be close to. Four million dollar budget, Craig. Is that is that what you remember? Four to five. Four to five. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, what we've been advocating for is listen. If, if we have some impact at the short term, but there's a long term benefit to us, you know, we're willing to have that conversation. There are certain things that they can do without our approval, and and we probably them to avoid those options <laughs> um, and we have done some things recently with Newark that required a payment in lieu of tax as opposed to the tip or with the tip so um, those are some of the things that I think we need to consider um, looking at the long-term benefit to the taxation structure if economic or if commercial base comes to that area. So I'm, I'm sensing, or at least in the past, we've had some agreement that we are willing to enter into conversations related to TIFs and, and alternative funding methodologies. Is that still true? Yeah, um, certainly conversations. Yeah, yeah. With, limit, with, yeah. yeah. Conversate, we're, we're keeping an open mind. Yes, yeah, for sure.
we got some. Yeah, we did. We got some. And actually, we did get some payment. Actually, we did get some payment through the taxes. Now that I think about it, because the calculations had been messed up, and I had, right. we had to correct all of the calculations because they had not been paying us a correct amount. So we must have been getting partial. We must have been getting partial payments. The River Road tip, we're getting 100% uh, payments uh, from, from the city of Newark for the Red Room development. Um, anything else that you can think of? I mean, I'm not a developer. I'm going to say that right up front. So, you know, um, identifying these must haves or wants is limited based on my dealings with you know, these types of situations. But I think you know, if, if there are any others that you can think of, um, please either voice them now or send me an email. Um, I will be bringing this feedback in written form. You will get a chance to see that um, prior to the meeting so that you can opine that way as well. To be clear, I think that Yes, you do. You do like to opine. That is accurate. <laughs> this is a great development. I, this is, uh, we've been banging the drum for something like this for the better part of five years now. And the one thing that this community has lacked, that was a long thing to say, this community has lacked a, an overall development, joint development perspective that brings into play all of the parties that are affected. And then direct the types of development that the community wants to see and accept into areas where it would be appropriate. And that's exactly what this is. And so uh, I applaud the township trustees and uh, the village council and leadership from both groups uh, for pushing ahead on this uh, and for uh, showing um, real action in terms of how we and plan for development that's coming all around us. And how we can uh, make sure that, that we impact where that development goes and what it looks like. And you know, I would, you know, to me, the most important thing that we want at this point in time is the seat at the table. Uh, it's clear we can't contribute economically. We're not going to spend money extending sewer and water down 16. We're not going to uh, extend uh, wave development fees that, that don't come to us anyway. So we can't have the economic impact. Uh, I agree with you that it would be a concern if, if there was a proposal for a large-scale residential housing development coming in there that put us in a position where we couldn't house those students. There's an economic benefit, obviously, to receiving more students, but at some point, we hit that tipping point where we'd end up building a new facility and we're not prepared to do that. Uh, but I think as long as that group <coughs> adheres to the comprehensive plan, and as long as that group uh, welcomes the school board to the seat at the table to be involved in those critical discussions, then I would be satisfied with that. Uh, and when it comes to what we might do economically to contribute, whether it's uh, agreeing to forego some short-term tax revenue in, in the form of a tip, um, we'll have to look at it, obviously, when it comes up, but it would, in my view, you know, that, that's an economic decision that, that, that an opportunity presented that has long-term economic benefit to the broader community, including the Randall schools, uh, and some short-term uh, forbearance of tax revenue, that can work. Uh, we, can, we can make that work, and if it, if it brings the kind of economic development we need to see here in order to, to ensure the long-term stability of the schools, we'd be in favor of that. So I am... Um, very gratified and pleased that this discussion is moving forward. I'm extraordinarily happy that you've been uh, integrally involved in that discussion. And, and let us know what we can do to keep that ball rolling. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very well. Now you can talk about the yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. um, We do have a, a November 6th. We do have a levy on the ballot. Uh, first Tuesday in November. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll sort of kick that off. Um, there's a, a, a 
committee of community members uh, on the levy committee who have been meeting on a regular basis trying to plan uh, a strategy for the campaign because, of course, the school board and the school administration can't run a political campaign. Uh, we can educate, we can inform, and those of us on the board, not at the board, uh, can certainly advocate as we have and as expect we to continue to do so. Uh, but uh, I first want to thank those folks in the community who volunteer their time, their talent, their treasure, um, come out on, on you know, evenings and take time away from their family and their homes and, and their businesses to, to really work on a campaign that will be a positive, informative, uh, well thought out campaign to explain exactly what is on the ballot in November uh, and to um, lay out the facts for why we believe why, why this board approved that levy because we believe that uh, it's an economic necessity to ensure long-term sustainability and excellence that we uh, had a view of earlier this evening in our schools. I think it's essential. So um, I don't know whether folks on the whether you have some comments you want to add to that, whether folks on the board have some comments or questions about the, the levy campaign or the levy itself. But one of the things that I think I'm being asked most about is um, if it passes in November, what immediate changes will take place? Um, will there will will there be a reversal of pay to purchase pay or any of the things that have been put into place? And what what I've been sharing is that the board made the decision for the uh, fee structure for pay to participate for the entire 17-18 school year. That the 1819 school year will be a an addition. No, wait. 1819. Eight, I'm, in, I'm, I'm a year in the rears. 1819 um, school year, and then the, the budget for the 1920 school year will be a conversation in the spring. Um, but that this, those fee structures will be in place um, for the entirety of this year, um, which I think is consistent with what you have articulated. Um, and then, you know, the conversation will evolve to so what else will be either restored or um, and that's a future conversation for the board um, related to the budget at that time. Remember, also in this election, there's going to be a new governor. And, you know, we've talked about how in the past that's had a negative impact on the school's funding formula, so, or funding. Uh, so we want to be cautious about making any um, changes right after that decision uh, is made. So um, we are working on, you know, trying to answer people's questions that they have. Um, so again, if you have any questions that surface during your conversations with constituents, please send them back to us so that we can um, include them in any uh, frequently asked question um, information that we distribute. Um, and we can provide information. You saw probably the informational video that I released um, that talked about the uh, nuts and bolts of the levy, and uh, so we are trying to communicate as much information as possible given the limitations and constraints that we have. Yeah, relative to like reinstating you know, services or reversing fees and things like that and so forth, um, you know, I, I, I'm not inclined to make any promises or maybe do anything like that. And if we do have any conversations about it, it'll be here at this table in public, mm -hmm. right? won't be behind the scenes and so forth. And just the same way we don't have it in the past always chosen to show a cut list of what will be cut if a levy doesn't pass. I, you know, you deal with these things as they come about, right? And, and the end of the school year when we're going through the budgeting process is the time to look at what's right and the feedback from the community that we will have received all year and so forth and, and so forth. So I think that's the right answer. And I apologize not giving you more you know, concrete things to tell back to constituents relative to this, but I don't think that's like appropriate to hold things out there or to do that in that way. It's not, not the way we've done in the past. I don't see that the way it is, right? But certainly any conversation that we do have about changing fee structures or reinstating things will happen again in public as all the other ones do at this table with plenty of time for the public to make comments and, and you know, we'll gather opinions and comments and, and take those things into consideration as the budget. 
I mean, those decisions that we made were to get us through the 18, 19 school year, so yeah. it doesn't really make any sense that we right. would change anything extreme. And we, and we made them so that we wouldn't make cuts in the middle of the year, which is really disruptive to your exactly. student patient. So yeah. um, I think it totally makes sense that we would not, you know, next year's budget will come up in the session and we should have done it. Yeah, this spring. In the spring, yeah. But, but it's hard because I've already heard conversations about, like, what are you going to cut if it doesn't matter? Right? And that's not the conversation to have right now. <laughs> and it's not even like at this fall, then the cuts happen and so forth, right? I think it's, you know, like the school district needs to be funded and you need to fund it with this levy. I think that's the conversation, right? And we do the best with the funds that we have and do a fantastic job being extremely fiscally responsible within the context of what we have. This, that's all you can say. This board, this board has advanced what is in the best interest of this community and the school district from a long term funding process. So um, that is what's currently on the table for, for people, um, given the, the, the requirement to try and find a sustainable funding mechanism, given the demographics that you all have recognized and talked about, probably ad nauseum. Um, so I think that is um, important to continue to communicate that um, that is our goal. Our goal is to create a long-term funding process for the schools, given the limitations and the things that we've talked about, even in this meeting, with the deferred maintenance and the aging infrastructure. That is a critical conversation. And, and to absolutely continue to fiscally manage the district as best possible, regardless yeah. of what the fund situation is and so forth, right? We correct it's not whether we've had the cash balance at the end of the year or not, that hasn't changed our decisions about the best way to educate kids, right, and the best way to take care of our facilities and things like that. I don't mean to be showing too much of my frustration with the status that we're in and the things we've had to do in the past, because I think, you know, we're we working with the cards we're dealt with, but I think we do a pretty good job of that, and it shows up in the results that we have with the kids and so forth. So I, I'm confident, I, I'm feeling much better about this levy, right, and, and people's belief in the things that we say. I have a pretty good vibe about this study, but it's going to take a lot of work on everybody's part in the community. You know, maybe a lot more numbers in the committee, or a lot more numbers making phone calls and things like that. And I'm sure that our levy committee is on top of, you know, lessons learned from the last time around and in, in, uh, in recommunicating the message as best we can. I think if there are any questions that are surfaced, you know, with your constituents, please send them to me. Yeah. I think the levy committee has learned lessons from May, and they've also, I, I get the sense they realize they need to grow. So they're reaching out for, looking for additional help, volunteers and things, so they realize that. And I think they also, I, I don't know about anybody else, other conversations, but there's 50 days to election day, so I've noticed in the last week, people are coming, are saying things to me or asking me questions all of a sudden because I think it's starting to yeah. percolate that hey they're paying like, attention yeah. that they are yes if, if we do have somebody who wants to volunteer I can't find my kids now yeah. <laughs> wants to volunteer is there a place they can or somebody they can call yeah I, I'm not going to answer yeah, that okay. right now but, um, but there is an there idea. is okay. there are vehicles for and I can call well I can yeah. ask yeah. okay Firm to a living community member. Yes. Yeah, folks will always take people mm -hmm. yeah, Correct. So, and I think that sort of outreach from the board to the community is just it's part of our ongoing conversation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? No. I. Uh, we saw the evidence earlier. Yes. Of what a great school looks like, what a great school system looks like. Um, and We'll see during the levy campaign when you peel back the expense side of things. This community and the school district does more, far more, with less than any comparable school in the state of Ohio. So there's there's no credible claim out there that we don't spend our money wisely and prudently. Which is not to say that people wouldn't take issue with where we may spend some money here or there. That's always the case. But we're very careful to 
as we saw in Tanya's presentation, we, we stretch those dollars farther than they ought to be stretched. And so people might surmise that if the levy passes, we would spend some money in certain areas. And, and as my colleagues have said, we will. You know, the, the surest expression of our policy here is in our budget. Right? That's where you put the money behind what you want to do. Uh, and the board will do that next year during the budgeting period with whatever is available to us to budget. Whether it's um, whether the passes or not, we'll set the budget for everything. Just as we did this year when we, after the levy failed in May, the board was very intentional in making cuts to get through the school year, but not minimizing, excuse me, but trying to minimize as much as possible the impact of the classroom. So we made cuts in other areas, which are very impactful to our students and to our school system. Uh, and will have a, a detrimental effect on the students in the long term if they didn't impact the classroom. And then we imposed fees so that we wouldn't have to lay off more people. The board will go through that same very thoughtful, intentional, thorough process next time around and set those same priorities. I'm confident of that, but I believe that if people look at what's accomplished here and look at what's spent here, they'll find no better value in the state of Ohio than to find in various schools. So I, I really thank the Levy Committee for their hard work, their efforts, and getting out into the community and showing that information and sharing that information. And each one of us is, is obviously responsible for that as well, and I think we all welcome that opportunity. Thank you. All right, Thomas, board reports. I guess indeed I'm pleased to be a representative and a school board representative on the uh, Granville Township Pathways Committee. Um, so, a number of years ago, uh, it must be 10 years ago or so, the village of Granville had a pathways committee where they created a walkability plan, right, um, highlighting where pathways need to be and so forth, and has been following that plan. Uh, the township now is creating a similar plan um, by taking the village plan initially and extending it to the borders of the township and essentially basically helping kind of frame what our future walking and pathways uh, system will look like. So it's been great to be a part of that. Uh, Bryn Bird is leading as a township trustee. There are a number of community members that are uh, uh, on the committee. And to date, we've basically taken the maps of uh, walkability from the past, updated them with the latest um, you know, changes that have been made over the last five or 10 years, and are suggesting potential future paths to align with the most used places in the, in the community. Um, also as a part of this, there's been a lot of work uh, going into a survey, which has just now gone live, I believe, and which we, I hope, can help proliferate the links to that and so forth through our various Google communication mechanisms. So it's pretty pass that along to you, or you have not okay. seen it yet. But. Yeah, just, just gone live recently, so it's a survey monthly thing, which basically asks, like, do you use pathways? Do you enough to many with areas where your priorities and so forth and that would be important to kind of get as much community feedback as we can on the survey so that we kind of prioritize where we want to have this on. So it's great and active committee. My expectation is it will uh, conclude uh, within the next couple of months after the completion of the survey um, and then prioritization of the results. Um, I attended the, the ODOT meeting where they were talking about the bridge Sixteen, right, and I had a couple conversations with them about pathways there. That bridge does not include a specific pedestrian lane, but there's accommodation a little bit on the side for a little bit wider lane, um, specifically because the township did not have a pathways plan, right? And so it's the hope that by creating a plan, that future development, whether it be by ODOT or by other individuals or developments, uh, can include. Great, and I think there's an increase in the use of the paths that we have, and it drives some tourism, and it drives you know, a lot of great access by our residents. So it's nice that the township is on the board and moves forward. And I'll let you know if there's any updates there. Uh, one other, uh, I don't know, if there's an update potentially the, the pathway that we get to school, we'll talk about that some other time when things are settled. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for serving. Okay. That's fine. Any questions? Action. Uh, 11.01 is uh, the contracts with the Educational Service Center of Central Ohio. Second. Second. Okay. These are um, the contracts for the teacher with visually impaired behavior specialist. <coughs> we um, contract with the ESCCO outside of the Lincoln County ESC uh, for those those educational services. Yep, almost identical. Dr. Corman. Yes. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. Thank you. 11.02 uh, is a consulting contract with Amber Gilsdor. So moved. So if you remember, Amber was our high school guidance counselor that left um, to stay home. Um, and we had a contracting service, or contract services, uh, service contract with her last year because we had a new, uh, or two new uh, people in those positions. This year, uh, Liz Adams is pregnant. She's leaving out on maternity leave. We felt it would be in our best interest to have a contracted service with Amber continuing this year so that nothing falls through the cracks, especially for students that are graduating and applying to college. So that contract is at the same level. Is it kind of like an extended sub? It's, it's a uh, from substitute type of position, or is it done based on time? It's done based on time. Is that deliverables relative to what's required and so forth? But that's, that is more accurate. Okay. Good. That's perfect. Yep. That's great. That's fantastic. Miller. Hi. Ms. D. Hi. Mr. Wolf. Hi. Dr. Corman. Hi. Mr. Jennings. Hi. Thank you. 11.03 uh, is the ELL handbook. Um, so moved. Second. Okay. So minimal changes. Uh, Gwen, do you want to opine? The, the only uh, major change in there is the state now requires us to use their uh, screening tool to determine if students are eligible for uh, EL services and so that was the major change to the handbook this year as the states created their own screening that mirrors the test the students take in uh, February and March uh, to measure their progress for language acquisition so that's the major change in the handbook this year
since the forecast was adopted in May. Two primary causes. One, um, our enrollment is up a little more than we had forecast in May, so that's adding some revenue in and state aid um, because it is enough. Is it actually enough to get us off the projected guarantee amount? I thought we would be on next year. Um, but between the 28 kids who showed up during the year last year plus the growth, we will, I'll show you a graph at the end that has that. And the other is just for some um, cleaning up of the estimates around other revenue around the pay to participate and uh, um, the TIF payments from um, the Redwood project, which are coming in a bit higher than we had anticipated. To win. Um, expenditures are pretty much online. Um, I'll have a lot more detail on that in the October forecast. At this point, there's nothing that is causing any concern on the expenditure side of things. Um, we're pretty much right where we would expect to be. If you look at page six at this point in the year, as far as our overall spending, um, it's pretty much in line with the last three years as a percentage of our total expenditures. Um, cash balances on page seven. Um, we are meeting our balance in all but this coming January and the following January, um, which has been the pattern now for a while. Um, you will notice at the, the last bar on that chart on page 7, June 2020, you'll see that the June number is very close to that cash balance number. And so if this projected out one more year, you probably see a couple additional months that are falling below our guide, the board's adopted guideline for cash balance. Overall cash, we are actually at the high point of the year at the end of August because of property tax elements. Um, you can see from the prior page, we will be spending down at a fairly rapid rate over the next five months um, until property taxes start coming in again in February. Um, the last Two pages um, that are just add-ons, um, the enrollment. Um, this is the current enrollment forecast. This, this is a little different from what I've shown you in the past in that this does include students going to CTEP and going to the county units. Um, the ones I've shown in the past have not included that. Um, this is, th I've included that now because it gets the numbers more in line with how the forecast software works. Um, and, and so I've done that. You can see from last year to this year, we have a net gain right now of 13 students. Um, does that sound like a lot when you consider the fact that this year's kindergarten class has 82 fewer students than last year's senior class did? So we started 82 students in the whole and still ended up plus 13, meaning we had a net migration into the district over the summer of 95 kids, um, which is a very high number, um, that higher than we have seen um, in prior years. I think we had originally been looking at the at being about flat this year on enrollment, so yeah, we're actually up a little bit right now. Um, I assume that will continue to grow to go through the year. That has been the historical pattern. Um, you know, I don't know that it will be at last year's level where we had 28 kids between October and May, um, but if we added another 10 or 12 kids, that would be within a norm, you know, norms that we've seen in the past. And this reflects like all of those are left down our record or don't left at all. Yes, everyone at this point, that's all through the system. And then the final page, um, we are done with our real estate settlement. Um, the good, th these are the, co the collection rates, and you will see our current collection rates are very high. That both in re class one, which is residential, and agricultural class two, which is business. Um, this year, um, this will be the 2018 collection year bar. It, both of them were well over 98%, which is an excellent um, current collection rate. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. That, you know, most of our taxpayers are paying on time. Questions? Good news, good 
Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Ms. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Jadine. Aye. And then 13.02 is the per the permit appropriation for the fiscal year 1819 school year. Um, unfortunately, the appropriation document seems not to have made it into the packet. Um, there's very little difference between the initial, the temporary one. The really, the, the one big difference is um, I had just kind of, you know, it, for the operating budget, I had bumped it up a little bit initially. The permanent appropriation is actually at the same level as last year's appropriation because. We are expecting to spend less um, in this fiscal year than we did last year. Um, so the permanent appropriation is actually at the same level as last year, which was $29.9 million. Um, the only other change, real cha significant changes um, from the temporary appropriation what is in all the federal funds, because at the time we did the temporary, we did not have any of our allocations um, for this year. Um, and so, the permanent appropriation has reflects our actual allocations from the state and federal funds. Um, nothing else has changed other than marginally. Questions? Um, Ms. Davies? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Jr. Aye. Ms. D. Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Miller? Aye. Mr. Corman? Aye. Mr. 